Penn State football grinds out a victory over Central Michigan, 33-14. to I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, here on the BWI Live postgame show. Let's kind of have a conversation about what we just saw. The Nittany Lions did not get the blowout victory that they were hoping for, and there's a lot of factors that went into this game. A lot of them, for Penn State fans that just want blood on in every game, are going to be um, excuses, I, I, I think is a fair way to put it. But bottom line is Penn State was not sharp today. Penn State came out and had a very good game last week against Auburn. They were, other than some pre-snap penalties, precise, aggressive, active. Uh, and I'm not going to say, because I, I always hate it when people say, ah, they, they didn't try hard today, because they absolutely tried hard. But they were imprecise in what they did today. And some key players didn't play for the Nittany Lions. J.B. Nelson, uh, the third string left guard, was in the game at times today. Penn State tried to play depth early and that was reflected at certain points in the game also give credit to central michigan for coming up with a good game plan and being very adaptive throughout the game james franklin went into the halftime saying that they were playing much more cover zero than penn state expected so they're giving a different look which central michigan is traditionally a coverage team cover three want to play those safe zone coverages and uh when you're forcing penn state to run the ball uh, into tough looks that opens up the deep passing game. Sean Clifford came into this game two of 11 in deep passes, according to PFF. So uh, Central Michigan forcing Penn State into something that they're not great at. Uh, Nick Singleton struggled in this game. We'll get into some of that today, but we're also going to be taking your questions on the BWI live post game show. Um, this has been the game. David Greeter right out of the gate with a donation here. Linebackers are horrendous in coverage, zero energy, O-line and D-line. Awful and sorry performance, which is on the coaches. Defense is not good either. We first turn turnovers, but can't stop anyone from moving the ball. David, I don't know what you want there. They had five turnovers, one negated by penalty, and over 12 pass breakups. Uh, I disagree about the uh, I disagree about that last part. But this was the game for those that have been Jonathan Sutherland isn't a good football player. This was sort of that game in the middle of, of the, the game. That was, that was what was happening was uh, some underneath coverage issues, some man coverage issues, and then a couple of plays where he was out of position as a run defender. But I would not say they were uh, a bad defense. And the, let me just pull up the stats here. They finished with, 13 pass breakups, five quarterback hits, a forced fumble, two interceptions. I would say what was lacking today were the tackles for loss in the run game. And we'll get into some of that as well. Uh, David, thanks for the donation. Appreciate it. Sorry that you're angry donating after a 33-14 win. And it was a dis it was a dissatisfying performance. There's no way around that. We're coming into this game, every single person was picking... Uh, either the over in this game or they were picking Penn State to win and cover and they were looking at Penn State being a dominant victory 50 points 40 points I think I I think I had 46 to 24 was my prediction just assuming that Penn State would not have a flat game but uh, the offensive and defensive line uh, you know I, I don't put a lot of this on the D line today and I'll have to go back and that's with the understanding of kind of a hurried first watch when you're in this trying to do live analysis and, and trying to give you a, a replay immediately after the game. There, there's going to be things that are going to show up later that I did not see. But what I saw for the most part in the middle portion of the game, especially in the second and third quarter, was that Central Michigan was forcing the defensive backs to be a part of the run fits, whether it was Keaton Ellis, Zaki Wheatley, or Joey Porter Jr. And Joey Porter Jr. was great today. In pass coverage, he had three more breakups, but um, he has no interest in playing the run. He just is he, when you have when he has to fill a gap. This happened against Auburn. One of their bigger plays came when Joey Porter Jr. was run over by I think it was Tank Bigsby in that game. You're going to expect that every once in a while. But today there were at least two, if not three times that he was expected to come down in a run fit and either uh, was not aggressive towards the line of scrimmage or at the second level missed a tackle. Um, so that's a, that, that's a thing that we've seen over time. And teams have done that to Penn state where they force the defensive backs to be a part, to be a part of, of run fits and, and getting into, 
the run game in general. Now, that doesn't mean that the the team overall played better, and I'm, I'm putting it all on one player. That's just one of my observations. The second level of the defense does have a responsibility in some of these situations. Dom DeLuca missed a tackle on a key run that set up some points. Um, so it, it either way, Penn State was not dominating up front the way that the <laughs> that the Central Michigan team was dominating up front for a while. Early in the game, four tackles for loss. Uh, a couple of instances where uh, Juice Scruggs, I think, was struggling today at center, and Nelson beside him made a couple mental errors on some plays that that killed them early. But really, and and I hate to be talking about all the bad things that happened uh, to start out this game when they win. They do win 33-14. Let's talk about Katron Allen. Katron Allen had a day. His uh, performance today was exceptional. So let me get uh, some of this stuff out of here so that we can see, uh, so I can show you just how good he was today because his um, performance is the performance of the day, in my opinion. His ability to run, to make people miss. I think if you like PFF grades, he's going to have a great PFF grade after this game. 13 carries, 111 yards, a long of 37, an average of 8.5. He's the consistency that this team is looking for from the running game. He's the consistent back. Today, Nick Singleton, the boomer bust, was bust. 12 for 42, averaging, averaging 3.5 yards per carry. A couple of things that were going on in the game when it comes to Nick Singleton is Penn State was going again in those condensed formations, bringing the receivers in and giving all that green grass to Singleton to uh to run to the outside but i think today what central michigan was doing was goading them into that okay we'll give you all that green grass and then they blitzed the safety and they were they were spilling to the outside they were aggressively attacking that outside there was also a couple of times where singleton had good blocking had to follow his blocks get inside on a pull block but the outside was open and when you do that when 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 players are pulling to the point of attack and you run outside of them that's a situation where you're running against the leverage of the block and then you're running into a linebacker that can then release and if if the player that's blocking tries to hold on to that block that's a hold so you can't hold in that situation so a lot of those plays where he was trying to bounce got strung out and uh central michigan did a good job of rallying to the football and tackling and not missing those tackles. The same is not true of Katron Allen. I, I think on one play, he broke three separate tackles. Uh, again, 13 carries, 111 yards, and a touchdown. That's the story of this game. Sean Clifford, 65% uh, com percent completion percentage, 217 yards, three touchdowns. Statistically, it looks like a great day, but I think it was, as Stephen Light pointed out, and Stephen, I wanted to thank you again for the donation to the channel the other day on uh, the lot on our on our Thursday preview show. Want to make sure we you know that we saw that, so thank you and thank you again for always being here. He says we almost got bad Clifford, but hey, I'll take it. And I think that this is going to be a game plan going forward against the Nittany Lions: is stuff the line of scrimmage, and once again force the ball into Sean Clifford's hands. And it's not just Clifford. There were some dropped passes early in the game, back-to-back -back plays that killed a drive and, and fourth down turnover with Mitchell Tinsley dropping a ball. It was a low ball. It was not a great throw, but it was um, it, it was one he could catch. He had a rough day. And this is something we saw at practice where I don't know that Penn State is particularly happy with what they're getting from their receivers. You see Parker Washington here, six for 64 um to lead the team nine targets six catches Brenton Strange having a great season so far two touchdowns Mitchell Tinsley is kind of the big play guy but not really nobody's getting open in uh single coverage at the moment and and another part of this of we'll see once we look at the film is what was happening off screen what was Clifford not seeing what was uh What's all the other stuff in football that makes the quarterback look bad? But I think pressure did affect him on some throws. You got some, maybe some bad decisions. And a lot of that was being goaded into taking the deep ball. And he is, you know, as we said, not exactly a great deep ball thrower. That's been a consistent thing throughout his career. Eli says special teams carried them. Gotta be better. I, I can't stop smiling about Barney Amore. 
I just can't stop smiling about his performance so far. Has he had a bad punt? I, there might have been one bad punt in the first game against uh, against Purdue. But other than that, every ball has died at the one or the five or the seven. And if it's not for a couple of special teams blunders or, you know, some machinations outside of his control, uh, he would have probably zero balls for touchbacks. So, you know, not just the not just um, Curtis Jacobs picking up that that fumble on the special teams, but also the punting has been exceptional for the Nittany Lions. Uh, Eli, thanks for the donation. Uh, let's see what Chuck has to say. The clouds are in. Well, here's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Allen's a tough runner. D keeps forcing turnovers. The bad crossing routes killed us, and Clifford was way off today. We made their tight end look like Gronk. I mean, he made some great plays. Like, let's also be fair to him. Independent of what was going on from Penn State, uh, the tight end uh, carrier, I believe it is, was awesome. Or was it Wilson? I, I apologize. Um, I think it was Wilson. You know, this is this is an interesting another interesting thing of there might be a blueprint of how to attack Manny Diaz in this particular game because that touchdown play was indicative of some of the stress points on the defense. If you're going to blitz on a fourth down at the goal line and your your linebacker who we all know is a, a good short area athlete but does not have elite long speed has to run with a tight end who has a clean release. Penn State was not getting pressure today, which was a problem. They were not getting on the other side of the line of scrimmage, and uh, and and you've got a free release for the tight end who doesn't have any traffic to run through, and a clean pick on Tyler Elsden. Just ran right into the guy, and it was illegal. That's what you're going to get. So delaying guys out of the backfield was another thing today uh, with Nichols. I think especially was not exactly a screen. Sometimes it's a dump off, but if you've got an automatic blitz called anytime somebody stays into block and then you fake staying into block and then leak out late. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a shorter throw, but against better teams, I think that that's going to be something. It's something that I've been concerned about with this defense of, if you are forcing guys to stay in, and we've talked about how many three-man pass routes they've been going up against here uh, this season, then eventually somebody's going to risk it. Somebody's going to say, "Okay, we're not going to stay in. We're not. You're you're going to blitz your linebackers and keep the tight end in the back end. We're going to leak out." And I think that's where some of those plays came from. And by the way, uh, give credit to Central Michigan. This is the give credit part. Their offensive line is good. They've got two true freshmen uh, or freshman tackles, I should say, that are going to be good football players, but they're not good yet. Uh, the left tackle may be more than the right tackle. And the quarterback, Richardson, is a good quarterback. He's smart. He sees the field well, and he knows where to go with the football. So aside from holding on to it a couple times too much, he made good decisions, and he got the ball out quickly. But this is the game plan for the Nittany Lions. Force the ball out quickly, jump routes, Get Kalen King, get Zaki Wheatley and uh, Joey Porter Jr. and all of your defensive backs to the catch point and let them make plays. And again, we'll throw this back up here again. This was this is the story of the game. 13 pass breakups, according to the Penn State, uh, the Penn State stats here and uh, two interceptions on the day. So thanks, to everybody who is in the chat. We're talking about Penn State and Central Michigan. If you're here. Thank you for joining the BWI Live Post Game Show. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, taking you through what I saw in the game, talking about what you saw in the game. And if you're watching the video, please hit the like button. 128 people watching right now, which, by the way, I'm so glad you're here. A noon kick against Central Michigan where the game was kind of blah. It wasn't a blowout. And the fourth quarter mattered, but did it? You know, it was just kind of one of those dissatisfying blowout victories where you didn't get to see Christian Veyer and you didn't get to see Bo Perbula and uh, Drew Aller didn't get into the game uh, in the second quarter like we talked about. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being and being interested in what we're talking about. Like the video, if you would. I know you're already here taking the time. Some of you are donating to the channel, so thank you. But liking the video helps spread the news that we're talking about what happened. Uh, the X's and O's break down as best we can right after the game. David coming back. Every team has moved the ball with ease on PSU. The problem was down the road when 
uh, down the road when Michigan and OSU QBs just make smart throws. I don't know if you saw what was going on in Michigan. I don't know that J.J. McCarthy's making a ton of smart throws right now. Uh, but your point is valid. There are parts of this defense that are risk reward. And this is, David, this is, I guess, my point of Penn State was not sharp today. Jonathan Sutherland made some mental mistakes uh, when in coverage that allowed a touchdown. Uh, the defense, I don't know that was gap sound. Again, a lot of that is a car crash up front. Got to understand what Penn State was trying to do before we can give an analysis of why they were a little bit leaky in run defense, which is another thing coming out of this game. Although 23 for 88, 13 carries for 67 yards isn't great, but if that's what you're limiting at the end of the game, one of the most prolific runners last year in college football to, the statistics and the way it looks are definitely different where 363 yards, but 14 points. This has been, this has really been the story of the season for Penn State. And, and yes, I think, David, your point about getting down into the low red zone, better teams are going to convert those into points. And Penn State was not able to consistently put points on the board themselves. So when this narrative flips, when this game script flips, What's going to be the what's going to be the change? Now, what I don't think is going to change against some of those quarterbacks. And again, OSU, we're, we're putting a very high standard here, by the way. And I know that's the reality of this division that they're in. This is the reality of the conference they're in. But that's the, one of the best quarterbacks and one of the best offenses in America. They are going to give up points to them. But the, the question is, are they going to give up 37 points? Or are they going to give up 28 points? Showtime. Showtime's back. He says crossing patterns were also an issue. Uh, tackling, but I agree. Uh, 31, 33, 14 can't really cry. Solid win for Penn State. The crossing routes, uh, the there was a man zone coverage thing going on today. I think the crossing routes were more of a problem for Penn State, where their offense was not in sync in those situations. And I think part of that was getting a bit of a left hook, getting something a little bit un unanticipated from Central Michigan, but offensively too this is something I've, I've, I've said on friday is that central michigan is a pretty well coached team they do some things really well now throwing <laughs> throwing the ball to the other team is not exactly a well coached thing to do with two interceptions on the day but smart decisions and trying to get all those little edges they do a lot they do a very good job of in this spread offense that they run trying to get all of the little edges that you can when it comes to uh, offense and, and blending different things of man versus zone in run blocking and, and, you know, quick throws, making things look the same. They do a lot of smart things. So it is, it is hard, I think, uh, to get a read on. And if you're not putting up a ton of points, this is the other thing. Penn State never got any points to put real game pressure on Central Michigan to get out of what they wanted to do. I think they came out throwing the ball more than most of us expected but they still were able to keep somewhat of a, of a balance in their passing attack. Um, and that's, that's going to be uh, an issue for Penn state. If they can't put the game pressure and really make this defense sing, you've got to be able to score points. You can't, I don't think this is a shutout defense. This is not a Brent pry 2021 defense where you can play a little bit of soft coverage, make guys drive, get turned like everything they did last year they're going to give up more yards this year because it's 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 kind of baked into the defense um the Penn State DBs though are on fire they are everything that we build them for before the season which is is nice because there's been several players that have not been that uh but you you look at some of the plays that Johnny Dixon made today and that interception was textbook he was in the hip pocket of the receiver. He ran the route for him. He is inside leverage. And then he goes up to an underthrown ball and give a uh, shout out to Tig Brown, who got pressure on that play to force the underthrown football. And then he goes up and he secures the catch. So a great play uh, from Penn State in those, those timely situations. Now, the again, like we said at the beginning of the show, the cover two, cover zero thing, I think that was situational more than it was when James Franklin, if you missed this, if you weren't watching the, uh, the, the game with the sound on James Franklin went in at halftime and said that they were playing more cover zero. They were putting more pressure on the quarterback and blitzing more than they expected. And there was more 
you know, the, the translation is we were running more zone routes than things we would run to get uh, to get big plays against cover zero. But then they went they went back to it. And there's just some plays on film where this is where I struggle. The eye in the sky, I've got all day to rewind and watch and see where the coverage is set up and how everything's breaking down. How much can you expect Sean Clifford to see in those zone coverages? Because there were players that were open, a little bit of pressure, he's late with the football, and then you you get an overthrown ball to Mitchell Tinsley that doesn't convert, and you punt. But the ball was there. Like, the play was there immediately. And there's the throw with anticipation, and there's the throw that you make when you're a quarterback that there's a guy open, right? That's always been a struggle for Clifford. And then he goes out and and they run yet another naked bootleg where he's rolling out. He's got a, a defensive end in his place in his face, and he throws an absolute dime to Parker Washington in the exact spot it's supposed to be for a big play, for like a 27-yard play. So you're just going to get some things Clifford's not going to be able to do. And I, I think we we had it earlier from Stephen Light that said bad Clifford uh, almost showed up. Now, uh, Kabindra says, is Penn State ever going to do something about the kicker? We can recruit or get someone uh, in the portal. Pinninger seems to be with PSU longer than Sean Clifford. Kicker will be the end of Penn State. It has been a struggle. It has been an issue for the Nittany Lions, uh, without a doubt. And they did get Sander Sahedek, who is the top-ranked kicker in the last class. But if they don't trust him to kick the football yet, they don't have a situation where they have an answer, I don't think. And Jordan Stout was the answer last year. So special teams has been very good for the Nittany Lions. I think we saw that today with the punting game. The kickoff game has largely been good. They just shut down any opportunity for a return. And uh, I'd say the other area that for special teams that has not been great has been punt return um, really since Jahan Dotson in 2020. Not a lot of people were punting to him last year, but this year you're getting more from Parker Washington. The, the kicking game, there has not been an answer. And truthfully, I don't know how you solve that because uh, there, there's not another kicker on the roster I think that they're going to go to. Um, let's see. We got somebody else here I need to get to. Tyler says, does the kicking situation concern you? Yes, it does. Uh, good thing Good thing we covered that. Thank you for the do donation, Tyler. Thank you to everybody who's donated so far. Very generous crowd for a 33-14 to 14 blowout over central Michigan blocked extra point plus short kickoff. So the kickoff situation was interesting because they were rotating through guys today. Where Sahedek, Pinnegar, I believe Nwosu. I, I missed, I missed the opening kickoff in terms of paying attention to it. Um, so I'm not quite sure about that opening kickoff, but they did rotate out of the regular people and the regular players that were, that were used to that were used to so far this season. Um, so Penn State wins 33 to 14. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Showtime's got another comment here that uh, he says, also have to realize Penn State, the last game was against an SEC game on the road. You won convincingly, then you come home. It was going to have a little bit of a letdown. Yes. But is that acceptable? And that's that's kind of where that's kind of where I've struggled when it comes to like post-game analysis and the analysis of football in general is that's not supposed to happen for good teams. And that's not to say that these people aren't human, right? These are 18 to 22 year olds or 25 year olds. If you're Sean Clifford, it's not supposed to be that way though, because that's what the institutional messaging is all about. It's not about the other team. It's about the standard that you want to play to. And Penn state today, I, I, I struggle again with the result versus the outcome, like the, the expectation. Penn State scored 14 points in the first quarter and then seven points in the second quarter, six and six. Is that is that good against the Central Michigan team? Once again, that was very susceptible through the through the air in the secondary. Um I I I'm a little bit concerned about the passing attack going forward 
this is where I think it, it's it's not necessarily when it comes to this team was a little bit unfocused today. And again, I, I struggle with this of there were mental mistakes in terms of plays that weren't executed correctly. I always hesitate to say there was a lack of effort because I don't think once you step out there, you can give a lack of effort. But Penn State played depth players in the first quarter. Cam Miller was on the field in the first quarter. So does that psychologically have an effect on the team um, that they think this isn't like that they think this is different, right? Or that it's uh, is it just that there are youthful and experienced players out there when you've got. Uh, players that have not seen as much of game time action in, and now they're in the first quarter and there's just players that are making mistakes that way. I do think on offense, there was a little bit of that in the first half where <laughs> I said this earlier in the game, Penn State playing as many depth players early is going to make sure that the most important depth player, Drew Aller, doesn't see the field until the fourth quarter because uh, you're not putting up the points you're expecting. And... It's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B when it comes to this in my mind of Central Michigan executed better throughout the game. Penn State was more talented and a little bit less focused for whatever reason. James Franklin will obviously have comments that you can check out here on YouTube. His post-game press conference is always up almost immediately afterwards uh, here on the YouTube channel. So check that out uh, once we're done here. David says, any chance of Carter to Sam, he can fly around. So... Maybe, but I, I I did not see him there today. When when he was on the field, Dom DeLuca was on the field. So that that means he's not playing Sam. And uh, if it was going to happen, it would happen this week. I think the conversation about him playing a different position has has been there. But you don't get him playing fast if he's playing a new position and he's that now you resetting the clock on what he has to learn and what he has to remember because there are different rules for different positions. There are different objectives. I, and this is the other thing about the Sam position. It's hard to play well because you've got to, you've got to be in two worlds at the same time. You have to be a run defender who has an awareness of their gap from five yards away. So if, if the Sam linebacker, you have a field split where where it's on the far hash and the field linebacker is lined up four or five yards outside the box. Maybe he has the B gap. So he's got to fill his responsibility in the run from five yards away while also in certain coverages, he's responsible for the flat. So you've got like 40 yards you've got to cover and two different responsibilities. That's why you've got to make choices at that position. Do you want a linebacker that's going to be better against the run? Or do you want a, sa a safety that's going to be better in coverage and is going to be able to get to those drops? And that's the Manny Diaz situation of, okay, we're going to stop the run with six in the box and maybe we'll drop a safety down. But that linebacker, RPOs, quick game, bubble screens, we're going to shut that down with that Sam linebacker. And then from that situation, we're going to blitz and we're going to blitz from everywhere. I'm hesitant to say that Carter would be good there because I think a, it's hard to be good there and B that's not the best use of his talents because a lot of what you're doing there is preventative maintenance of you're not throwing into the flat because we're putting the numbers here. So Sutherland is acceptable at doing those things Today he struggled, but I, I just I, I wonder if that's the best use of a player in that situation. Uh, we're here on the BWL Live post game show taking your questions. Flying solo, Tom Hannafin will be back this season, but right now it's just me and you. And you guys are being awesome. Thank you for the donation again to Jamie Hamlet. And I apologize if I haven't said everybody's name correctly. I am not good at live reading, sight reading music, uh, live reading of things. Not my strength. So Jamie Hamlet with a name that I can say. So thanks, Jamie. I understand the need to mix in the depth and talent to have the experience mid to late season. But why have them in so early? That's the risk, right? Especially when Penn State gets a turnover quickly. They get up 14 points and then they don't score. This offense is inconsistent because they don't have a complementary uh, uh, arsenal of weapons. They can run the ball. They can get explosive runs there. They didn't get as many explosive 80-yard touchdown runs, but they still got 
Catron Allen was phenomenal today. 13 carries, 111 yards, great vision, broken tackles. He is a guy that can run in any system. I think Nick Singleton, and, and I, this is a gross generalization, so don't kill me on my gross generalizations here, but kind of how I'm seeing this right now is Nick Singleton, when it comes to his running style, they're putting him in more gap schemes where he needs to read a linebacker, press the line of scrimmage, make a cut, get outside, get downhill. Catron Allen is a back that has great vision. And, and Matt Millen was accurate to say that on the show today of, you know, kind of watching the flow of the defense and knowing where to go when you cut back, when to not cut back, when to hit the hole, all of those things, the patience he runs with counter power sweeps inside zone, outside zone, when the big plays aren't there and the defense is doing something that is corralling Singleton's athleticism, that's why I think today we had to be a Catron Allen game. It's something I was thinking at halftime. I hope I said that on Twitter so I don't sound like I'm saying it post-game. But um, that's what today was. It was a Catron Allen day, which is going to be, it's not going to be 80 yards. It's going to be 37 yards, three broken tackles, a stiff arm to the face of a defensive end, which was really cool to watch. Like you just don't see a 200 pound guy, stiff arm, a 290 pound guy and run away. That was, that was a, a cool move he made there. Um, and still 166 yards, 5.2 yards per carry. This offense got it done eventually, but they did tighten up that rotation on the inside. And Jamie, to your point, I think the guards really struggled today. There was a couple of stunts that Sal Wormley was laid on. Uh, the scent, the interior of the line in general struggled today. Juice Scruggs led up a couple of backside uh, pursuits for TFLs or that that kind of strangled some runs. And then Landon Tangwall had an up and down day. He looked good a couple of times. And this is, again, where I wasn't watching every single player on every single play to give you a full report. But he did get some big plays on some, you know, on some pull blocks and he got to the point of attack and he sealed some holes and then the holding penalty and some of the pressures on the interior. That's kind of what gummed up Penn state's attack. And when you get to Sean Clifford today, central Michigan got to Sean Clifford. Let me see uh, here again on the stats. The difference is, you know, from here we'll see post game with PFFs grading the pressures because the, the pressures and moving Clifford off the spot, when you move him off the spot, he's not as good. There, that's that's a pretty clear thing. And when you consistently move him off the spot, then he tends to break down fundamentally. But um, only four tackles for loss today and three quarterback hits. So not a huge day from Central Michigan in terms of getting to the quarterback, but enough that I think it it broke the rhythm of this offense. And and there was a lot of repetition today, a lot of bootlegs. A lot of bootlegs from Penn State. Sometimes, sometimes that that uh, didn't work. And then other times, 36 yards on some plays. That was a thing that they did early that I thought they did really well was early in the game, Parker Washington over the middle on that crossing route, really to start the game, I think it was. Playing off their tendencies from the last game. Condensed formation, you motion in, hard play action with Singleton, all the linebackers step up. All the zones are voided, and it's a really easy throw for the quarterback over the middle, and then Parker Washington gets the ball and um, and is able to to get some extra yards. Bad rhythm in the game, or up early, thought it would be easy from from Mike, and and that's right. It felt like it was going to be an easy game today, and it just it never got there. It never got to be an easy game. That's you know kind of the. They grinded out this victory today. And I do think late in the game, they were able to figure it out with Catron Allen running the ball, getting um, Michigan State was uh, Michigan State. Sorry, Central Michigan was a little less aggressive in the second half. They were throwing a little bit less at Penn State and then Penn State was able to get some of those yards and get some consistent push on the ground. And I think that's an encouraging sign. They also put their starters back in there. That was another big thing is that when they were in those situations, it was because the the starting offensive line was back in the game. Sorry. If you're in the chat here, I'm trying to do two things at once. Host a very intelligent, hopefully, and uh, an informative postgame show, and also destroy the bots in the chat. So 
we're all doing double duty today. Like like a Sam linebacker, I'm in two places at once. So you got any more questions? We'll be talking to you for a little bit longer. This game, I think, was pretty cut and dried, though, in terms of this was a good Central Michigan team in terms of the game plan and some of the execution, but they just were not talented enough to stay with Penn State. And Penn State's defense, I think, is going to be very polarizing this year. That's not going to end. They're going to give up drives. They're going to give up some points. And when it works, it works really well when there's a lead. Um, Sam says, I think we need to not overreact to some of this. They're a young team. A win is a win. You're not going to blow out all the teams. Historically, Central Michigan is uh, pretty good. That's kind of what I was just trying to piece together there, Sam. So thanks for the assist on that one. That's that's kind of what today was. And the young team part, I think, especially this is the danger <laughs> of relying on an 18 year old freshman in Nick Singleton. It's why Penn State lucky they have Katron Allen as well, that in this game he had 42 yards and he, he bounced back. I want to give him credit in the second half. We didn't see him late in the game, but I think I'd, I'd, I don't know if that was an injury thing. I don't know if that's the situation there. I genuinely have no clue, but. Ride the hot hand. Katron Allen was doing a better job. Vision. This was a mature running back game. Central Michigan was just not going to give up the explosive run, the the big time breakaway speed thing. They were going to bottle that up. That was one of the main things they decided with their game plan in the first half. So then it's about patience. And with Penn State, Singleton still developing that patience, that vision. Katron Allen has that patience and that vision. So good that they have both of those players and they're able to adapt. Another thing we talked about uh, last week was the number of different running schemes they can use on offense now. And, and that's going to be the driver of this team. I'm, I'm pretty confident at this point, central Michigan, like Purdue. I don't think that any of these are exceptional secondaries, but Penn state's not, an exceptional passing team. I think Tinsley and Parker Washington are good receivers. They're going to be functional. Although Tinsley, I think had a, his worst game of the season so far, they're going to be able to prop up the, the passing game, the intermediate passing game, some catch and run stuff, but there's no game breaker right now. And the reason Amari Evans is on the field is because he's got speed. You can't teach. I talked to James Franklin. I asked him about, uh, about, uh, Tinsley, I'm sorry about Amari Evans. I think it was last week. And you know, that conversation of what they're looking for at receiver. And when he talked about Amari Evans, he said, he's got speed. You can't teach, but really his growth has been learning, uh, routes, how to understand how to change your, your route based on the defense, how to understand the defense and what they're trying to do, how to run the receiver position, like how to be a receiver. He's trying to learn all those things. Cause he used to be a, a high school quarterback. So other than speed, He's got to work on all of it, but Penn State needs that speed. They need Trey Wallace, Keandre Lambert Smith, Malik Mega, or Amari Evans, somebody to consistently make plays. A couple drops today. And when players got out into open space, Central Michigan did not allow them to break it for a big play. So a little bit of a uh, good game plan, a little bit of not doing, uh, I think young team is a good way to put it that Sam has it here. James gives us a donation to the channel. Thanks so much, James. Appreciate that. By the way, if you're watching on replay, please give the video a like. Uh, I'm now talking to you from the past like a ghost. You can also give a super uh, super like, I think is what it's called. It's a little heart with the dollar sign at the bottom of the video. Appreciate the donations if you're not watching live. Uh, and and by the way, if you do, we will we will acknowledge you in the comments. I'm so grateful to everybody who donates to the channel. James says, I was really anxious about this game and the non blowout right up until I saw every other team today, including Georgia who won by less to Kent state. You, you bring up a good point. And here is a theory. This is the fourth week of the season. We officially know what teams are doing now. Penn state's put stuff on tape that central Michigan, Michigan could watch. We know what Penn State's identity is shaping into. So Central Michigan is the first team to deploy a game plan that is 
probably mostly based on what they've seen over the last couple of weeks. Same thing with Georgia. Same thing with uh, Michigan and and uh, Maryland. I haven't seen what happened in the conclusion of that game, but it was super close. They also played a team for the first time this year, so we're learning more about that group and and just throwing out my hot take here. I, I just don't think J.J. McCarthy is a great quarterback right now. So teams have now enough film to formulate a more accurate game plan, which is going to frustrate some teams. And Penn State, they found a way to adjust and continue to score points, but they're not consistent, and they're making too many mental mistakes that are limiting the the efficiency of the offense and putting the defense out there in a lot of interesting situations with a lot of the fourth down calls. This team and the run defense in particular is something I'm going to be watching going forward. And again, got to check out what happened there. Only a couple of minutes more here on the BWI Live Post Game Show. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Thanks to everybody who's contributed so so far throughout the uh, throughout the afternoon. You guys are the real star as my co-host today. This is a long meandering stream of consciousness. Without you, you are the the you are the lens focusing all of the things today. So thank you, Richard Hess said. Uh, Clifford did a nice impression of Carson Wentz. That's rough. He did not throw the ball to the other team four times. He didn't fumble the ball on a 16 second scramble. He did have an issue with pressure and seeing the field clearly when he had guys in his face, which every quarterback does, but that's his thing. That is Sean Clifford's thing. Um, and that's also Carson Wentz's thing, you know, some clean pockets that I think were still kind of an issue for Clifford though. And uh, again, full breakdown, full film breakdown at bluewhiteillustrated.com coming up later this week on the offense and the defense. So subscribe for just $1. You get 12 months of access for insider content, including all the stuff you want to know about the team from our insiders, Sean Fitz and, and Nate Bauer. These guys, they are the fountain of information. If you want to know what's going on with Penn State football, the inside information and throw that around a lot for a lot of people. These are the guys that know what's going on. Ryan Snyder, this is the guy that knows what's going on in recruiting. Same thing with Fitz. He, he's uh, striding both worlds. Greg Pickle, our intrepid reporter, breaks news faster and more accurately than anybody on the beat. And uh, I tag along with my film analysis and my uh, insights into the game. And of course, my lame jokes here on YouTube. Uh, and thanks to everybody who is here. If you're, if you're here, please subscribe as well to the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. We are chugging along at an amazing pace, and that's because you guys support the channel like Larry here. Uh, Larry is pro. By the way, Larry, I, I practiced your, your handle last week because I read it a couple times. PSU doesn't need elite receiver play. Georgia didn't have a game-breaking wide receiver and still won a natty. They just need efficiency. The run game is for real. I would counter with George Pickens. George Pickens is a game breaker. He's an absolute game breaker. Now, is Stetson Bennett to George Pickens one of the all-time great receiving uh, combos in history? No, but they did have a game-breaking receiver that could create explosive plays anytime you put the ball in his zip code. Those plays helped. And, and Georgia had an almighty all-time defense. Like, now you're comparing... That's like comparing the Miami Hurricanes back in, in their heyday or... You know, apparently I'm only thinking of former Hurricanes, the Baltimore Ravens in 2000, like historically great defenses we all remember. Penn State's not that. They have a great secondary, and their secondary, by the way, is uh, better than last year's. And I love Jaquan Brisker. I thought that secondary was amazing. And this is this is the point, Larry. You're correct. You're correct. Pickens was out 95% of the year. But in big games, he can't do a big play. I can't. You're right. Yeah, I'm going to give that one to you, but I just like George Pickens. You know, I just think he's a very good talent. Um, so this is, this is, and, and this is one of those situations that is Penn state's running game. Larry, is it good enough to win all the games without support from an explosive passing attack? They've gotten some good passing plays and this is the situation. I think this is, this might be where we end the show because Penn State has done a great job of play action and dialing up some easy throws for Sean Clifford. And not easy in the sense of he's still got to take a shot to the ribs when throwing it to Parker Washington over the middle and make a good play. But the situation is that it was open. It was a clean read off the play action. 
Penn State, with their running game, can dial some of those up. But in third and medium, or when you want to take a shot, can Sean Clifford and these receivers get the ball downfield? I think their short passing game is good. You know, like we've seen it. Their short passing game is good. Today, Central Michigan was all on top of it on the screen game. But intermediate part of the field, deep part of the field. And what I'm asking is, can they have a complete offense? Can they threaten every part of the field with every single facet of football? Because right now, they've got a good running game that we sh- we saw today can adapt. Um, they have a, a mature quarterback who's not going to make a ton of terrible decisions until he makes a couple really big ones. But for the most part, like as far as quarterbacks go in college football, the bottom is way lower than Sean Clifford is operating right now. He's good. He's a good football player at the moment. Do they have that third gear that can go toe-to-toe with teams that put up 38, 45 points? Uh, and we're really talking about what's the what is the ceiling of this offense. And do we know what the ceiling of this defense is. There have been good quarterbacks. Uh, Rourke was a good quarterback. uh, Richardson, I think his name today was, is a good quarterback. These are good Mac quarterbacks. Aiden O'Connell is a good Big Ten quarterback. Um, But elite talent, they have not faced an elite talent quarterback yet. So we'll see, to everybody else's point earlier in the show, of can can they do it against everybody? And this is my concern that Matthew says here. Clifford's deep ball was way off and that's been historically documented. So we'll find out Penn state is in in unequivocally a better place than they were last year. This is a better team. They put up a better performance today than they did against Villanova, right? So 33, 14, the final score Penn state is able to get a win and leave September four and oh, they're able to put up, 33 plus points every single game. And this was their lowest point output of this season. Last year, that was not the case. 17 points, 24 points. Like they put up points this year. So even in their bad game, 33 points, a healthier team leaving the non-conference schedule, going into a game against Northwestern. And then of course the bye week. So I'm your host, Thomas Rencar. Thank you to everybody who uh, showed up today and participated, especially thank you to everybody who donated. Uh, and, and I just want to say, like, we appreciate it so very much. I can't tell you how much it uh, helps the channel. It helps me in particular. And uh, it is, um, it really means a lot to me that you guys believe in what we're doing here and you believe in what we're talking about. So thank you so much. Um, but we'll be back with more analysis. Monday live show coming up eight o'clock on Monday night. We'll have recruiting next week. We'll have analysis, instant analysis after the game from the guys that were at the stadium. And of course, we'll have James Franklin's press conference if it's not up already as I talk for 50 minutes. So check out all that at bluewhiteillustrated.com and of course here on YouTube. I'm your host, Thomas Rankar. We'll talk to you soon.